Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. So we're going to be focusing on rediscovering the leadership attitude of kings. Write that down. What are we going to focus on? Rediscovering the leadership attitude of kings. Oh, this is going to be so good, I can't wait. First of all, I want you to write a statement down. This statement will become the anchor of our entire conference this week. And here it is. And remember this as we discuss the spirit of leadership. Cultivating the right attitudes that affect human action. In other words, what makes a person a leader, whether they are 16 or 61, is that they develop some attitudes that affect people. What makes government call on me to do training? Why would I get a letter from a president of a country and he flies me in first class to come and speak to his cabinet? I was born on an island that's seven miles wide. I still live there. Why do heads of states invite me in to talk to them about leadership? Because something happened to me. When I was 15 years old, something happened to me. And I'm going to talk to you about that. Because you see, I was transformed from an island boy to a diplomat. My government of the Bahamas has already awarded me the highest award of our country. They did that before I was 41. I was the youngest of my country's history to receive the highest award in my nation. Then I received an award from the Queen of England. It's called the OBE Award, the Order of the British Empire. It is given to those who are considered to be global leaders. When the Queen awarded me that award, Queen Elizabeth, I was wondering why she gave it to me, because I'm just getting started. So I come to you not as someone who is trying to fake it. Listen to me, because I used to be just like you. And I'm going to teach you how to become just like me. I'm going to teach you how to be transformed from just making a living to impacting life. You were not just born to pay bills. That's what sheep do. Here's something to remember. Write this down. And I call it understanding the spirit of leadership. And here it is. An army of sheep led by a lion will always defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. I repeat, an army of lions led by a sheep will always be defeated by an army of sheep led by a lion. In other words, the issue is not who's following is who's in leadership. Leadership determines everything. You can turn an army of sheep into a mentality of lions if the leader has a lion mentality. So if you want to be successful in life, make sure that the person you're following is a true leader. Because not everybody in charge is a leader. I'm going to prove it with a statement made by the greatest leader of all times. He said, if the blind lead. Now wait a minute. According to him, the leader could be blind. 
He said, if the leader is blind, then whoever is following that leader will fall into the same ditch the leader falls into. So if the blind leads the blind, they both fall into what? The ditch. That means that because you are following doesn't mean your leader can see. This is why I wrote that book on the power of vision. When I train people in business, or young people who want to go into business, or people who wanted to start living a life of effectiveness, or if I train governments or corporate companies, I always recommend that book to them because if I don't deal with vision in those sessions, they will lead people into a ditch. You have to have a clear vision if you're going to lead people to their destiny. Here's our philosophy this week. I call it the lion in the sheep. Trapped in every sheep is an undiscovered lion. Sit up with me. Trapped in every sheep is an undiscovered lion. You know, you're sitting next to someone who looks like a sheep. But you don't know who you're sitting next to. I told a story, and I will tell the story tonight. It's a true story. You listen carefully. A few years ago, I was in Zimbabwe, southern Africa. I went to speak to a conference in Harare, South Africa, in Zimbabwe. It's a beautiful city. I went to a, the Hilton Hotel in Harare. The golden lions out front, beautiful. It's a fantastic hotel. And when I walked into that hotel, greeted by the host of the conference, he said, are you ready? I said, yes. And there were 5,000 leaders in an auditorium in that hotel waiting for me. I had to teach three times a day. They worked me hard. And after four days of hard work, of training and leadership, the host said to me, I have an invitation for you from one of our leaders out in the other village. He wants you to come out there to teach a session on leadership. I said, fine, I'll be happy to do so. So the next morning we woke up at 5 a.m. and I thought this was probably about an hour away. I was picked up by one of the young men of the ministry in a car that needed to be retired. And we drove for one hour Two hours, three hours, four hours, bumpy roads, into the bush. And I began to think, I think I'm being kidnapped. <laughs> and after five hours of driving, far into the forest, in the bush, in the jungle, we arrived to a beautiful village where there was the elders waiting for me. The children came and they were singing and, and welcoming me with fruits and flowers, and it was a wonderful experience there in Africa. And then they took me to a big thatch roof building, no walls, and sitting under that on the ground was over 600 people waiting for me to speak to them. And so I was ushered in by the chief of the village and was introduced and began to do a session with them. At the end of the session, I was the guest of honor for dinner with the chief. And when you are the guest of honor, you eat things you don't want to talk about. Because they prepare it specifically just for you. And I ain't going to tell you what I ate, because it's not important. Praise the Lord, I ain't going to eat it no more. <laughs> but when you are the guest of honor, you eat some strange things. So I had to sit down and receive all of that wonderful hospitality, eat things and pray while I was eating. And when I was finished, as it is their tradition, they began to tell me some stories. And the chief told me a story that took place in that area. And he said it was a real true story that reminded him of what I taught that day. And he said that there was a farmer in Zimbabwe who was a sheep herder. And he kept sheep for many years. And he would take them out to graze in the forest area in the hills of Zimbabwe. And one day while he was out grazing, 
he heard a sound coming from one of the areas in the bush. It sounded like a cat. And it kept on making this sound like a cat in trouble. He walked over to the bush and he moved the bush on the side and he found, to his surprise, a little cub, a little lion, a little kitten lion, just a beautiful little thing. And suddenly he, he pushed the bush back and he ran because he knew that if the father lion or the mother lion was nearby, they would kill him and eat him. And so he ran up on a rock and stayed there, never came down. His sheep were still grazing down there, and he was afraid. The sun began to set, and he wondered why the lion didn't come back for the cub. It began to grow dark, damp, and he knew that if he left that cub there, the cub would die. And so he came down from the rock very slowly, looking this way and that way, afraid as he approached the bush. He didn't want to leave the little cub out there by itself, and obviously this cub must have been abandoned by the father and mother lion. And so he put his hands into the bush, and he picked up the cub, looking left and right. He put the cub inside his little ragged shirt, and he ran with the sheep following him back to his little village. He went and just jumped over the, the fence, brought the sheep in, the pen, and he took the little cub in the house. And he began to cuddle the cub, and he began to feed the cub. And as the cub began to become acquainted with him, he began to adapt him as a surrogate mother. And he began to feed the cub every day, and the cub became very strong again and began to become vital. And, and then the cub began to grow around the farmhouse and around the sheep, and the, the cub began to go out with the sheep. Every time the sheep went out to graze, the cub would go with the sheep. And he would spend all his time with the sheep. And he would eat with the sheep and drink with the sheep and sleep with the sheep. And he would even stay in the pen with the sheep. And after two years, he became a beautiful, nice young lion. And he became so acquainted with the sheep, he began to think like the sheep. He slept with the sheep ate with the sheep, he drank with the sheep, and he began to think like the sheep, and he never growled. He actually began to make sounds like the sheep. He thought he was a sheep because he spent all his life with the sheep. And as he went out every day to graze with them, he would stay out there and be with the sheep. And he would try to chew the, 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 the green grass and the different leaves. He thought he was a sheep. And every day he would do this. And then one day something happened that he had never seen before. And the, the, the chief said that the farmer told him this story that, that changed his life. He said that one day, while they were grazing, he heard a sound that he had never heard before. The sound was like thunder. It shook the whole forest. It impacted all the echoes among the mountains. He became so afraid. And... Suddenly, he looked and saw where the sound was coming from, and across the river appeared a beast he had never seen before. It was the most monstrous beast, ugly creature. And the creature made this sound that shook the forest and shook the jungle and shook all the sheep. And the sheep turned around and took off and began to run toward the farmhouse. And the little lion that thought he was a sheep that became a big lion, he also began to run because he figured, if the sheep run, I'm a sheep, I better run too. And so he ran and jumped over the fence with the sheep. And they all stayed in the pen and they began to shake and they were so afraid. And they knew, my God, are we gonna be, are we gonna be destroyed? And as he peeked over the pen, Far in the distance, he saw that beast put his head down in the grass. And when he picked his head up, in his teeth was a beautiful little lamb drenched in red blood. The beast shook his head as if to say, I am the king. And he vanished in the forest with that little lamb in his teeth, soaked in red blood, as the sheep and the little lion shivered with fear behind the pen. He was afraid to go out anymore that week. The farmer took them to a different area. He thought he was a sheep, acted like a sheep, smelled like a sheep, ate like a sheep, thought like a sheep, drank like a sheep. And so he went with the sheep. And they went out 
to a new area, began to eat and feed. And suddenly he heard the sound again, and he became so afraid, he took off with the sheep, and they jumped over the pen again, and they knew, my God, the beast has come, the beast has come. And he peeped over the fence, and he saw the beast one more time, and there was the beast making that sound that shook the forest. And as the sound began to shake the forest, he put his head down and picked it up, and in his beautiful teeth was a beautiful little lamb that had become drenched in red blood. And he shook the lamb as if to say, I am in charge and he vanished into the forest and the sheep were so afraid they stayed in the pen the little lion that thought he was a sheep he began to shiver and shake along with the sheep he thought my god i've never seen such a beast in my life and about two weeks after that they went out finally built a nerve to go out to graze far and wide and as they were grazing again they went to a shallow part of the river to drink and he looked and across before he could drink, the beast appeared, and that sound came out again that shook the forest. And everything around him became so afraid. He knew, I'm going to die. And the sheep ran, so he ran. And they ran toward the pen, jumped over, and they hid behind the wall, shivering. And the little lion that thought he was a sheep, acted like a sheep, smelled like a sheep, ate like a sheep. He said, oh, I'm going to be destroyed. And he saw that beast. That was the first time he got a good look at the beast's face. He had never seen such a monster before. And he was afraid like the sheep were afraid. Seven days afterwards, they were out grazing. And this time they figured they are far away from that monster. And the little lion that thought he was a sheep, acted like a sheep, smelled like a sheep, ate like a sheep. He went down to the river with the sheep to drink. And as he leaned over to drink, he saw the beast and he jumped up and ran toward the pen and jumped over the fence and he saw the beast. He was so afraid he began to shake and then he became confused because he wondered why didn't the sheep run? And he was there by himself behind the fence wondering why didn't they see the beast? And after his confusion subsided he slowly walked back out to where the sheep was grazing. And as he walked toward them, he began to make the sound like a sheep to try and communicate with them as to why they didn't see the beast and they didn't run. And after a while, he became so confused and he went back down to the water to drink because he was thirsty. And he leaned over to get a drink. And when he leaned over, suddenly he saw the beast and he took off and he ran. And he ran back to the farmhouse, jumped over the fence. And he was confused because the sheep didn't see the beast. Didn't they see what he saw? He was so afraid. And after there for hours wondering and puzzled, he wondered why doesn't the sheep run? Didn't they see what he saw? He eventually wandered back to the flock, went in among them. And by this time, they had grazed down to a very narrow part of the river. And he leaned over one more time, because he was very thirsty now, to take a drink. And as he leaned over to take a drink, he saw the beast. He froze. He jumped back. And he was about to run, when suddenly, that noise, that sound, was across the river again. And he became so afraid, he knew... The river is so narrow, if I try to run, I'm going to get eaten like the lambs got eaten. And he stood there looking at that beast. As that beast made that sound that shook every muscle in his body, he knew it's over. And the beast did something strange. The beast began to walk in the water toward him. And as the beast walked, he stood there in the middle of the river. And he just looked at the little lion that thought he was a sheep, acted like a sheep, smelled like a sheep, ate like a sheep, sounded like a sheep. And he stood there and he made that sound to his face. And the sound became so loud, he began to tremble and shake. And he knew, I'm dead. He closed his eyes. He knew I'm going to be eaten. And the beast didn't eat him. The beast stepped two steps forward closer to him. And by now he could actually feel the vibration of the sound as the beast lifted his head and made the sound. His whole body shook with the sound of that powerful voice. And he began to wonder, I'm going to die. This is it. And the beast took one step closer. Now he's only five feet away. A 
as if the beast was making a point telling him, try it. And he understood in some strange way that the beast didn't want to eat him. The beast wanted him to make the sound. And so the beast kept on making the sound and came closer and made the sound. And he was so close now he knew that if I don't try to make the sound, he's going to kill me. And the farmer was on the rock watching this play out as these two interesting creatures stood in the river. And the beast made that sound. He forgot about the sheep as if he was transfixed on this little lion that thought he was a sheep, acted like a sheep, smelled like a sheep, thought like a sheep. And he made the sound to the point where the little lion said, if I don't try it, I'm going to die. And so he belly down deep into his gut and he tried to make the sound before he is killed and he, and he put all of his strength and he went mm, <laughs> and that made him conclude I'm dead because I sound just like the sheep with whom I spent all my life with the beast did not respond as he expected. The beast took two steps closer. And now he could almost smell the heat of his breath. As the beast made that sound one more time in his face. With all the power and shook every bone in his body. And the little lion that became a big lion that thought he was a sheep. Acted like a sheep, smelled like a sheep. He thought like a sheep. He knew, oh God, I'm dead. And he says, okay, I'll try one more time. And he went, mm, bear. And the beast went, and he went, mm, and the beast went, Rrr. and the beast wouldn't eat him. The beast had no interest in destroying him. And so the beast took one step closer. And now they're almost nose to nose. The little lion that thought he was a sheep, acted like a sheep, ate like a sheep, smelled like a sheep, lived like a sheep, slept like a sheep. He closed his eyes because he knew I'm dead. But the beast made the sound one more time and he felt it in his face. And something happened to that little lion that thought he was a sheep. He suddenly became angry. Not at the beast. He became angry at the fact that the beast believed that in him was something he didn't know existed. Listen to me carefully, friends. It happened to me. You never change until you are angry. You will never change what you tolerate. The beast refused to believe that the sound he made was his true sound. And so the beast kept on making that sound that he believed was deep down in that little lion that thought he was a sheep and he kept making that sound until the little lion that became a big lion that thought he was a sheep became angry and his anger took a hold of his whole body and suddenly he decided if he believes it's there then it must be there and he dug down deep to a point where he never knew existed as a matter of fact he decided I'm not gonna leave until I make the sound if he believes I can do it then it must be there because he remembered that what he saw in the water is what he saw with his eyes. Suddenly, he went down deep in the pit of his bowels and suddenly something connected and something began to bubble up on the inside of his internal organs. All of his body began to ripple with power. 
He connected with a source of strength. He never knew existed. His muscles began to shake. His whole bone structure began to tremble as if something took over his body. And he felt this thing coming up slowly that he never felt before. And suddenly, with all of his might, he went. And the beast began to jump. And the beast went. And he went. And the beast went. And he went. And the beast went. And he went. Suddenly the farmer said he stood there for 25 minutes watching a display of power he had never seen. And then suddenly, as if instructed by an unseen hand, the beast stopped and began to walk backward toward the jungle. And then he stopped. And the little lion that became a big lion that thought he was a sheep, acted like a sheep, thought like a sheep, ate like a sheep, slept with the sheep all his life. He knew that the beast was trying to say something. He was telling him, are you coming? Suddenly he became afraid again because he looked at the beast and he had felt something he never felt before. He connected with a self he never knew existed. He became so possessed by that power that he felt. He had a choice to make. And the beast walked back with just a few more steps. He's now among the jungle leaves and he stops. And he makes the sound one more time. Are you coming? And the little lion that thought he was a sheep acted like a sheep, thought like a sheep, grew with the sheep, ate like a sheep. Suddenly realized he had a decision to make. He looked back at the farm where there was a pen to protect him, free food provided by the farmer, protection from the weather, safety in a pen covered from the rain. Everything provided. Friendship among sheep. Then he looked at the beast and he saw nothing but jungle and hard work. Responsibility. Find your own way. He looked back at the farm and he saw a neatly paved road with structures in a house. He looked back at the beast and he saw no roads. You got to make your own way in that jungle. He looked back at the farm and he saw the food provided by the shepherd. He looked at the beast. And he realized, i got to find my own food out there. There was no security in the jungle. No safety in the jungle. There's no protection in the jungle. And he looks back at the farm and he saw everything provided. He was domesticated. That's what society does with you. They domesticate you. Domestication means they tell you how to act, how high to jump, how high you could jump, what you could eat, what you can't eat, where you could go, where you can't go. They put a fence around you. And he knew that if he went back to the farm, he wouldn't have to think for himself. The farmer could think for him. He would never have to plan his future. The farmer would plan his future. And then he looked at the lion and he knew that if I go into the jungle, there's no one to protect me. No one to plan for me. I got to think for myself. Design my own destiny. And so he looked back at the farm. And he looked at the beast. He looked at the farmhouse. And he looked at the jungle. And the farmer told the chief that he saw something he'll never forget. He saw him look in the water one more time. And this time he was never afraid. He saw himself. He looked at the beast and realized that he is the beast. 
So he turned his back on the farm, walked toward the beast. The beast made the sound one more time. And he made the sound one more time. And suddenly, he vanished. He vanished into the forest with the beast. And the beast, it's okay. And the little lion was seen no more until seven days later. They both showed up where the sheep were. They made the sound the sheep ran. They both put their heads down. And when they raised it up, they both had little lambs in their teeth drenched in blood. He had become himself. When I heard that story, I could not forget it. As a matter of fact, I wrote the story in this book. Because there in the middle of that jungle in Zimbabwe, I heard the most important reality of leaders and followers. The reason why I came to this conference, the reason why I flew here for hours today to get here, the reason why I left my wife and my leadership team and my organization and all the businesses that I run, the reason why I left them to come here is because I'm the beast. And I have come to make some noise. And by Wednesday, I'm going to start walking backward. And you got to make a decision before this conference is over. You can go back and be domesticated. Stay on a job where they pay you less than you're worth. Believe other people's opinions about you more than God's opinions? Or you can decide to leave the safety of society and enter the jungle of responsibility and become the real person that you were born to be. I heard some bears around here. You see, Jesus Christ is called the Lion of Judah. And he's going to make some noise this week in this conference. And you got a decision to make. Whether you will stay among the sheep and hide behind the pen and stay in the safety of welfare. And hide behind the wall of affirmative action. Oh, I ain't talking to nobody tonight. Or whether you're going to decide, ain't nobody going to dictate my future. I know what I'm talking about. No one's going to tell me what I can or cannot do anymore. Why? Because I met the beast. And he told me the truth about myself. In the book of James, there's a verse that changed my life. It says, the word of God is like water. And once a man looks into it, and he sees himself, it's impossible for him to deny what he saw. My job tonight is to lure you to the water. And I'm going to allow you to see the beast. And you got a choice. You can either run from what you saw, or you can become what you saw.
I want to close this first night on some scripture references. This is very important. Touch that for me, please. I want you to remember this. That the lion is the only animal given the distinction of being the king of the jungle. I've been to Africa many times. My wife and I went on a, on a safari one day in the Carib River on a boat. And we spent seven days on a boat and couldn't go in the water because in the water was piranhas. And there were crocodiles in, the, in that river and also snakes. And the way they do safari in the Carib River is that you've got to stay on the boat because if you come off, you'll die. You couldn't go on the land because where you were were wild animals. And we saw elephants every day. We saw lions. And we saw all these beautiful animals, giraffes out there just in the wild. It was your National Geographic life. I loved it. And they warned us not to go on land because these animals were, this was the wild jungle. And every night we heard the sounds of the lions. And one evening at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun was just about to set, we saw a pride of lions. And then we saw two elephants. And the elephant was like 10 times the size of a lion. It's okay. And suddenly, the lions decided they're going to eat this elephant. Ladies and gentlemen, the lions are small little cats. And the <laughs> the elephant was like a bulldozer. But you can see these four lions deciding, you are our meal today. And the elephant knew, as big as he was, he was not the king. Oh, you don't understand. You see, there's some things in life that look big like an elephant. And they can intimidate you if you don't know who you are. I sat there on that boat watching from 50 feet away, that close in the water. And I saw those cats using their strategy, creeping from different sides, laying in the grass for 10, 15 minutes quiet. As the bear, I mean, as the elephant begins to, to make sounds, he knew threat was around. And suddenly, as if on a mark of signal, they all ran to where the elephant jumped on his carcass hide. And his hide, as thick as leather, they dug their claws into his leather hide on his hip. One went for the neck. And I saw one of those cats put his big claws around the neck. Couldn't get it around. And he, and he put his teeth in the neck of the elephant. And the elephant began to swing him around. And all of them began, they began to swing. But they wouldn't let go. As if to say, you are ours. I believe God's going to raise some lions tonight. By Wednesday, we have some people who say to their problems, I'm going to put my claws in you. I'm going to put my teeth in you. And no matter how you shake me, I ain't going to let go until you come down. That's the way lions hunt. The lions have an attitude that overpowers the elephant. It's not the size of the prey. It's the attitude of the hunter. And I sat there in dismay, amazement, to watch that elephant fall like a big cannon. And I saw those lions gnaw away at his leather hide. I never forgot it. I saw the king at work. I saw what a king is like. I see why they called him the king of the jungle. Secondly, God identifies himself in only two animals in the Bible. He identifies himself with the eagle and the lion. And I wondered why 
these are the only two animals God identifies himself with until I began to study these animals. You see, I discovered that God knew the nature he put in those animals. And he placed in them the same nature that he possesses. So he said, I will bear you up like eagles. And he said, my son shall be called the lion of Judah that breaks every chain. You see, the lion possesses what God possesses. And you were created to be just like your father God. I believe sitting in the chair right now, wrapped up in a lamb wool, is a lion. Sitting in your chair right now. And the folks around you think you're timid. But they don't know how dangerous you are yet. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. Even your mama don't know who you are. I'm here to tell you, your daddy don't never seen you before. You see, your friends who you hang out with, they don't know. Matter of fact, most of them are sheep. By the time I finish on Wednesday, you're going to change your friends. Because there are people who you cannot hang out with if you go into your destiny. Write this down to understand your true nature. You've got to study the nature of these animals. That's why I love the Word of God so much. In my book, The Power of Vision, you'll see a picture of an eagle on the back. And then in this book, The Spirit of Leadership, I put a lion. Because I have discovered to become like your father, you must have the attitude of a lion and the vision of an eagle. And that's what the Holy Spirit is after this week. The leadership that's trapped in you have never been released until this week. I'm proud of you. The gift I see is still unknown by Africa and China and Asia. It's still unknown by Europe. Don't be impressed by the Americans being proud of your gift. The world is too small to have one nation know you. I want you to think like a lion. The world is your jungle. I wanted to wrap up this night on these thoughts because the rest of this week is going to be a rough ride to the jungle. What is the goal of the kingdom of God? The first statement made by Jesus Christ concerning his message is found in Matthew 4.17. It's an attitude statement. Here's what he says. His first public statement in his ministry is found in Matthew 4.17. He had just been baptized, spent 40 days in the desert. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He began his work. And here's his first statement. It says, from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven has arrived. What's the first word he used? What's the first word he used? I'm asking a question. What's the first word he used? I can't hear you. What's the first word he used? What's the first word Jesus used? What's the first word Jesus used? Say it loud. Shake the roof for me. Wake up your neighbor behind you. Now the word repent has been taught by Christian religion as the act of coming forward in a spiritual meeting to an altar and bring up your past and feel bad about it. That is not repentance. That is called remorse. Those of you who are biblical scholars, 
Hopefully you will know by now that the word repent used by Jesus here is a Hebrew word which is translated into the Greek language which means to change your mind. To change your mentality. Wow. His first announcement attacks your mind. His first invitation is a mental transformation. He said, change the way you've been taught to think. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven has arrived. The kingdom demands a new way of thinking. Change your mental conditioning. I have come to the conclusion that Jesus insulted all of humanity by his first statement. He was saying that everything you've been taught to think is wrong. That's an insult to humanity. Your society is wrong. Your culture is wrong. Your governments are wrong. Your education is wrong. Everything you've been taught is wrong. Now that's an insult. And he said, if you're going to live in this kingdom, you got to get rid of that mentality. You know what's holding you back? Your mentality. Being born again doesn't change your mentality. Being born again does not change your mentality. Being born again does not change your mentality. <laughs> Being born again is not changing your mentality. Being born again does not change your mentality. The most schizophrenic people in the world are Christians. They claim everything and they do nothing. <laughs> Paul wrote this note to Christians. Romans 12. Verse 2, he was writing to a church. He said, be no longer conformed to the thinking of this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Everybody say renew. renew. Write it down, quick, 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 quick. Everybody say renew. renew. Say it loud. I can't hear you. Renew. Everybody. Young man, say it. Renew. Say it loud. Renew. He said, be ye transformed. How? He didn't say, get a new mind. Okay. Write the word renew. You get it down? Now, that word renew is not a word. In grammar, it's called a grammatical construct. A grammatical construct is when you take a word... And you add a prefix to it. What's the prefix? Re. Write the, write the prefix down. Re by itself. Re. R-E. Got it? Now the prefix re means to go back to the original state. I repeat. Re means what? To go back to the original state. <laughs> That's why the first word Jesus used has a re in front of it. Oh, we're going to have some heavy stuff this week. Paul says, you will not be transformed until you stop going forward. Turn around and go back to your original self. Go back and get your original mind. Oh, help me, Lord. Young people, listen to me. What they are 
teaching you in school will not make you successful. Guaranteed. They are teaching you to get a job. I have come to teach you to own a business. Society conditions you to behave, to conform, to be normal. But I have come sent by the beast to teach you not to conform any longer to this world's way of thinking, but to be transformed by getting your original mindset back you were not born to be normal you were not born to be normal you were not born to be average you were not born to be normal some people are so busy trying to fit in they never stand out I'm talking to myself in this place so you want to dress like everybody wear your hair like everybody wear the same pants below your hip buy the same shoes buy the same snake leather shoes buy the same tie like everybody else why don't you break away and develop your own style I'm going to talk to myself this week. Everybody say repent. repent. Let me just give you something to remember. Everybody say pent. Okay. If you take the prefix away from the word, then the word is pent. Pent is a word. Write the word pent down. Pent means top. Highest place. Woo. Jesus. That's why the building you call a hotel, the highest room is always called the penthouse. Well, Jesus Christ is telling you that somewhere along the line, you move down to the first floor. Oh, I'm talking to myself now. His first announcement, come back up here where you belong. Scream somebody! Oh, I can't teach this. Tell your neighbor, come back up here. Where you belong. Tell your neighbor, get your mind out of the gutter. And come back to the top place. Clap your hands, all you lions. Paul says, be ye transformed, how? By not getting a new mind, but going back and getting the original mind. Get the first mind I gave man. Let them have domain. Clap your hands, all ye lions. Hallelujah! Oh, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it. Yes, I like it. You were not born to fit in. You were born to stand out. Woo! You were not born to live on a farm. You were born to live in the jungle. Tell your neighbor I'm a jungle dweller. Tell your neighbor I decide how much I get paid. Oh, hallelujah. Tell your neighbor I decide how high I go. Tell your neighbor I don't follow paths, I make paths. I only 
still listening to me? Tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor no more bad. Tell him. Oh, I see the real you coming out tonight. Sit down, quick, quick, quick. Got two more minutes. He said, change your mind. The kingdom demands a new mentality. From lion to sheep, and then from sheep to lion. You fell from lion to sheep. Sheep is not your permanent state. Sheep is not your original identity. Let me prove it. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, We are all like sheep. Gone astray. In other words, if you are astray, you are sheep. Each one his own way. But it says, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That means lost is sheep. Found is lion. Remember this, write it down. It says we are like sheep. It never says we are sheep. Christianity glorifies sheepness. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited what I'm going to say next. Whoa, don't you miss it back there. You see, we have been fallen for 6,000 years, 7,000 years, starting our 8,000th year. We fell so long from being lion, we think we're sheep. So we act like sheep, talk like sheep, walk like sheep, dress like sheep, think like sheep, eat like sheep, live with sheep. we just sheep. And we are so sheepish that we are afraid of lions. Oh, get me for a go now. Remember the little lion? He was afraid of lions. So here is God, the lion of Judah, looking down on his kids, thinking like sheep. And he knew that if I go down to help them in my lion clothes, See, he knew. He tried it before. He told Moses, I personally would like to meet with the whole camp. Tell them to wash their clothes. Meet me at the mountain. I don't want to meet you, Moses. I want to meet the entire camp. So they washed their clothes. They all came to the mountain. Everybody's waiting. And here comes the Lion of Judah stepping down from his throne to talk to his kids and the Bible says the earth began to quake the mountains fell apart lightning and thunder and smoke and the people ran away they couldn't handle him as a lion so he decided I'm going to disguise myself. I ain't no sheep. Don't forget me. Now. I ain't no sheep. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want the kids to run. So I'm going to make myself of no reputation. My reputation is lion. But I'm going to hide that in a lamb. Come on somebody. So when I come among them, they'll think. They will just think that I'm one of them. 
Oh, I'm talking to myself. And so he became like one of us. He is not one of us. He became like one of us. Who us? Lord sheep. Because he knew we were not sheep. I said he knew you were not a sheep. But he knew that you were being conditioned and harassed and trained to think below yourself. And so he put on sheep clothes. And the Bible says, and the word was made flesh and dwelled. One time he wanted to make sure that Peter, James, and John did not think he was a sheep. So he said, you three, come. I want to show you all the real me. He took him up on a mountain. <laughs> and he got rid of his sheep clothes. <sighs> and the Bible says his real self shone brighter than the sun. And they became afraid. And they became, listen, 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 impressed. Don't miss this. They became what? Impressed. That's your problem, you see. You are impressed by me. And that's your problem. They became so impressed, they wanted to build three houses in honor of what they saw. And all they saw was who they were. Oh, you don't get it yet. See, the problem is, most of you are going to be shocked this week when I reveal to you who you really are. You're going to run from yourself just like the little lion did. But I'm going to run after you and keep growling. Until you turn around and join me in the... You have fallen so far, you are impressed with your true self. Do you know what he told them? He said, don't build anything. Why? Because this is nothing to build anything to. This is normal. We are just like sheep. How do I know that he hid himself? In sheep clothing. But here's the original idea. God created man for rulership, not religion. Secondly, man was given dominion as a mandate. Thirdly, whatever God calls for, he provides for. That means if God calls for dominion he's already put it in you he will never demand what he didn't supply dominion is hidden in you and is trapped under timidity and conformity fourthly man was created to dominate everything except the image of God that means you were never created to dominate other people not to be dominated by other people. 
Don't you forget that, son. You were created to dominate, not to be dominated. But man fell from dominion, not from heaven. And therefore, I am convinced that trapped in every fallen man is a spirit of dominion, a leadership spirit. And I submit to you then that every man is searching for his dominion, his domain. We're going to learn that this week, that each one of you was born to dominate an area of gifting. You found yours, man. I see it. That's your domain. You found your, your gift, your true self. Now you got to expand your borders. There's an area you were born to dominate, young man, young woman, that no one else can dominate like you. He never gave you dominion over people. He gave you dominion over a gift. And your gift makes room for you in the world. And turns you into a leader. And therefore your pursuit in life. Is to have dominion. Your kingdom pursuit is to have dominion. I want to leave you with this verse. A couple of verses here. Because I got to set this up for tomorrow morning. 12 o'clock. Read this verse with me. Read Galatians 3.26. Read. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed yourselves with Christ. Are we all agreeing with that? Okay, read the next verse. verse chapter 4, verse 1. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians entrusted until the time set by the father now most of you in this room have no idea what this verse means but i was born in the bahamas in 1954 when i was born we were under the kingdom of great britain we were not a nation i was a subject of a king follow me carefully in kingdoms don't miss this. In kingdoms, when, don't miss this. Got to write a song about this. Don't, don't miss this. This verse cannot be understood in America. It can only be understood in the kingdom. Listen. Whenever a king has a son, a baby, as soon as the baby is born, they take the baby to the mother, the queen. She looks at the baby for a few minutes. Listen, 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 please. Then they take the baby away from her. All kingdoms do this. And the baby is then given to a group of people called guardians or tutors. Listen. In other words, the baby is taken away from the mother because they don't want the mother to bring the child up. Princess D's sons were taken from her. Why does the king take the child from the wife to queen and give it to this group of people called the tutors or the guardians? It's because the job of this group is to make sure that this baby does not grow up thinking like normal children. Their job is to teach this child who he is, how he must dress. How he must walk, how he must live, how he must think, who he is, what he is, 
his history, teach him his heritage, his genealogy. They teach him how to hold a fork and a knife, how to sit at a table, how to sit in a chair, how to cross your legs properly. They teach him what never to do. Now put your hands over your chair like this. You will never see Prince William sitting in a chair with his hand in the back of a chair. It's uncouth, they call it in England. The tutor's job is to make sure that that child is brainwashed to think royalty. It's very important. Now listen to me. The child, please listen. This verse about that. The child is born royalty. But the child doesn't know. God says, even though you are a son, I'm going to treat you as if you are a slave. Because <laughs> mentally, you don't think like royalty yet. So I'll give you to guardians. Even though you are an heir, you don't think like an heir. <sighs> Even though you are a lion, you've been keeping company with sheep. And now I got to spend all these years retraining your mind. Until what? Until the time set by the father. When the king is satisfied that you've been completely brainwashed to believe that you're supposed to take his job. Oh, y'all don't get it. Then he tells the tutor, your job is finished. Listen carefully. Listen, listen. So, a king always has a child twice. Listen carefully. Because you were born in America. When the king has the child the first time, he calls him his child. But then he gives him away. And when the tutors are finished, he has a child again. The same child. So in every royal family, you got to be born twice. <laughs> that is why the Bible uses the term adoption. 
it doesn't mean you were not his son in the beginning. He wants to adopt you the second time. After you've been completely transformed mentally to think like royalty. Then he calls you his son again. And it's a ceremony they go through. When Jesus was born, God says, this is my son. He told Mary, this is my son. 30 years later, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. And he stood in the river. He had passed the test. God knew him. The boy knew who he was. Satan said, if you be the son, he says, I am. And after that, he came to the river. And God said, this, today, everybody said today. Today, I have begotten you. He's 30 years old. Here's my point. You've been living with sheep so long. You are not yet his adopted son. You're just son by birth. You're not son by training. This conference, some of you didn't understand the theme. And now you understand the theme. Yes, you are in the kingdom if you've accepted his birth. But this conference, he's telling you, now I'm going to tutor you. I'm going to transform your mentality to think like who you are. God is telling us, I love this verse. Read this verse. Galatians 4, 3. Read. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Why? That we might receive. My God. The last verse. Galatians 4, 6. Read. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. Stop, stop reading, stop reading, stop reading. He sent the spirit, capital S. Holy Spirit, into what? Your hearts. Write the word heart down, please, quick. The word heart here is the Hebrew word mind. Stop looking at your chest. I was shocked too when I did the research. The word is mind. The Holy Spirit was given to restore the spirit of kingship in you. Not to make you feel good. 
Not to make you fall on the ground and get slain in the spirit. He came to transform the way you've been trained to think. He sent his Holy Spirit where? Into your minds. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Abba. What's the word Abba means? Father. You see, Prince William thinks he's just another boy. But he had to be trained to think he's another king. So they couldn't trust the mother to do it. <laughs> Every tutor had a certain responsibility. One would teach him how to speak. One would teach him how to walk. One would teach him how to have diction. One teach him how to dress. One teach him how to sit. One teach him how to eat at a table. One teach him how to courtesy. One teach him how to receive gifts. Oh, you don't understand. He had to be taught how to receive gifts. The Holy Spirit has been given to you to train your mind, not your emotions, your mind to identify God as your Father. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.